Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, Executive Director of the Government Accountability Project. In a short while, we'll talk with an insider about the legacy of Bush administration science at the EPA. But first, when the House of Representatives passes a measure by a vote of 424 to 1, it's either something utterly meaningless or it's a bill that members cannot afford to be on the wrong side of, like one to protect kids against killer toys. And so it was with the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act signed into law last August. It protects against those killer toys, but much, much more. Here to discuss what's in the law, including a novel whistleblower protection provision, are David Arkish, Director of Public Citizens Congress Watch Program, and Ed Merzwinski, Federal Consumer Protection Director of the National Association of Public Interest Research Groups. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Ed, let's start with you. Um, what changes overall um, does the law make to protect kids and consumers generally? Well, Mark, first, the law gives the CPSC a very small agency. The Consumer Product Safety the Commission. The Consumer Product Safety Commission is granted a massive budget increase, tremendous new resources, and new legal tools to protect the public. Maybe I could step back just for one second and say that this agency was founded in 1973 with a budget of $34 million. In uh, 2006, its budget was only $63 million. That's million, not billion. And the Bush administration proposed an increase to 2007 of only $375,000. It had less than 400 staff, half its uh, biggest that it had ever been in 1980. But uh, President Reagan tasked his CPSC commissioners to tear the agency down. Since then, it had been under attack. So we had been trying a coalition of consumer groups, ours, yours, and others, for years to strengthen the agency. But it took killer toys from China, millions and millions, waves and waves, of toys containing lead and other chemicals for Congress to act. They more than doubled the $60 million budget over the next five years. They've given the agency new computer systems, money for a new laboratory, and money for more port inspectors. Uh, believe it or not, they only had one toy tester. And they, in addition to that, the centerpiece of the law is people are probably unaware that toys were never required to be tested for safety. No product was, and the CPSC never tested any products. Manufacturers simply said, well, they meet the tests, but they didn't have to do the tests. Uh, the new law says there must be required third-party testing and certification of toys for children. The new law also brings the lead limits in children's toys way down from where they were and expands them to more products and establishes new protections against toxic chemical phthalates which are chemicals that cause developmental problems. That's kind of an overview of the law. No, what are phthalates exactly? Well, a phthalate is a chemical softener. It's contained in any product that's a, a soft plastic. Uh, the, children's dolls used to be made out of hard plastic. Now they're made out of a softer plastic. That's because of the addition of softeners. Phthalates are a softener that has been banned in Europe and banned in several states already. It was a major victory to, by the way, strengthen this bill on the Senate floor. Usually a bill uh, that is an idea of some senator is this, the strongest part of the bill's proj process through the world is when it's the idea in the head of the senator and it gets weaker and weaker as it goes through the process. We were actually make, may, able to make this bill stronger all the way through and I give credit to our champions on both the Senate and the House side on that. Uh, David Arkish, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act also calls for the creation of a consumer complaint database. Uh, what's that about and what, uh, what do you hope it will accomplish? So the, uh, the CPSC has uh, really severe restrictions placed on it in terms of providing information to the public. It, uh, the Ordinary Freedom of Information Act doesn't apply. Uh, instead, essentially, there's a, a system where if the CPSC wants to disclose something to the public, whether it's pursuant to a FOIA request or otherwise, it actually has to get, vir virtually has to get permission from a manufacturer first. It has to let them sort of vet and, and, and uh, give comments. Um, it has to sort of assess the fairness of the disclosure. Uh, and, is this to protect uh, proprietary information? Is, is, why is that? Well, it is, it's, it, it's 
putatively to protect proprietary information, but it's, it's way overbroad. Um, if you ask uh, most of the major manufacturers what's proprietary, I'm not sure they've met much of anything that isn't. Uh, and so essentially this provision ends up just blocking, you know, or at least slowing uh, the ability of the agency to, to get really important information out to consumers. Uh, meanwhile, the agency is, is really over, uh, overburdened. Uh, as Ed was saying, uh, you know, has lacked sufficient resources to do its job, and it's the same, it's the same thing with replying to, uh, you know, FOIA requests. Frankly, especially with this added step of uh, running everything by the manufacturers, and so what the database would do is sort of uh, bypass that process for some types of information by allowing consumers to post complaints themselves. Uh, also, complaints from other third parties. Uh, third party being not. It's the, like the a wiki database. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, it would ha include uh, reports from police, from hospitals, uh, sort of any third party, and consumers yeah. themselves. And so, this way, a consumer can uh, log onto this database and search it if they're if they're getting rated by a crib, uh, and they have a particular brand in mind. They can check uh, and see if there have been you know numerous reports of problems with a certain. Uh, I could well imagine that manufacturers, if if somebody uh, posts something about their product that's negative, um, are going to bring some kind of injunctive action to remove that from uh, this database. Is, is that is the database protected against that kind of action? Yes, uh, fortunately, I mean the database the database was constructed in a way that it it, it uh, provides consumers the information they need, but also does protect concerns that that manufacturers have. There's a uh, basically, they have the the ability to uh, uh, comment alongside of uh, an entry in the database. Uh, they can bring to the agency's attention if there's uh, false information or in incorrect information in the database, and the agency is then under an obligation to correct it if possible or remove it if there's no possible way to fix the information. Mm -hmm. Ed Mirzwinski, uh, the new law also calls for increased civil penalties uh, for wrongdoers and. It provides novel whistleblower protection, uh, state-of-the-art whistleblower protection for employees in industry who report problems with product safety. Is that right? I think that's a uh, very good point on two additional parts of the law. Civil penalties have not been increased under the Consumer Product Safety Act for many, many years. And so they're increased not as much as our organizations would have liked. And of course, enforcement is another problem. You've got to have leadership at the agency that will impose those civil penalties uh, and to date we really have had a problem of leadership throughout the last eight years and then second uh, we fought very hard and uh, the government accountability project played a critical role in, in, in adding whistleblower protections to the new law for private sector employees who want to speak up about bad manufacturing practices or about for example information that comes into the company about complaints or deaths that they may not have timely reported to the CPSC. It protects them against retribution. I don't know if David has anything to add on the, that, that provision, but we thought it was a very important addition to the law. It's, it's, it's absolutely critical. I mean, it's the same thing with whistleblower protections, with uh, increased civil penalties, with providing authority for state attorneys general to uh, enforce the provisions of the CPSA. Um, these all come down to, to one thing. You know, whistleblower protections are good in part because they protect the, the brave individuals who actually come forward with information, but they're also good for the public. They're good for enforcement. Uh, and really a law, any law, is only as good as, as the enforcement provisions it contains. You can, you can write anything you want in the law, but if there aren't penalties, uh, if there, there isn't access to information, the ability to bring uh, enforcement actions, uh, then it's just words on paper. This law was signed into effect last August by President Bush. What kind of steward has he been of consumer uh, product safety during his tenure, and especially since last August? Uh, well, it, it's it's been very disappointing uh, for 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 the most part. Um, for example, the database that we just discussed, uh, the the agency has actually uh, refused to even start working on the database. Uh, claiming that the um, the law uh, makes its work on the database contingent on getting additional funding. Well, if you read the law, it actually says that the agency is supposed to make a, a plan within six months for the database, submit that plan to Congress, and then Congress is supposed to pr provide funding. And it makes a lot of sense that Congress would read the agency's plan before it would appropriate uh, money to fund the project. But the agency has sort of put the 
you know, said that it needs the money before it can start at all. So they've just refused to begin working on the database, for example. Uh, they've also uh, they issued a bad opinion on, on phthalates, one of the chemicals that we talked about. Um, they, they decided that instead of uh, phthalates uh, being banned, as the law says, uh, uh, from sale, uh, distribution, commerce, uh, manufacture, beginning on February 10th, uh, instead, uh, the only thing that's banned after February 10th is manufacture. So if, uh, if anybody has stockpiles of products that contain these, these products that are, have essentially been declared toxic by the federal government, they can, they can keep on selling them in the agency's opinion. Uh, uh, there's actually a good development on that. The uh, public citizen uh, and the NRDC sued the CPSC over that decision and actually just won the lawsuit. It's kind of hard to reconcile uh, a recognition that this is a public health hazard and then say, but go ahead and distribute it sometime. Right. Mark, if I have a second, if I could just add, from the beginning, President Bush was a terrible steward of consumer protection. His first nominee as chair was defeated in the Senate, Mary Sheila Gall. His first approved nominee had only one achievement, and that was to say that uh, in a rule on mattress safety, if companies complied with the mattress safety rule, then any consumer who was burned had no rights under state law to receive compensation if they were hurt by that mattress. This new law rescinds that view. His third nominee, a National Association of Manufacturers executive, uh, withdrew his nomination under a cloud. We've had an acting caretaker there, and I'm hoping by the time this show airs that the President Obama will have nominated a pro-consumer chair to take over the CPSC. Congress did its part, now we need a new leader. Well, let's use our remaining time to talk about what President Obama's uh, stewardship of the Consumer Product Safety Commission should look like, uh, armed with this new law. Well, the, there's, there's a world of difference that new leadership could make at the agency. Uh, swift construction of this database and doing the job right, uh, giving guidance for businesses on how to comply with the, the laws, um, there's a series of, uh, of rulemakings, guidances that the agency needs to issue. This, this new law doesn't just give the agency new enforcement powers and new resources. It also actually places a lot of affirmative obligations on the agency in terms of new rules it has to pass, new studies it has to undertake. It's a lot of work. And uh, we need someone who's going to get in there and roll up their sleeves and, and, and really work on behalf of the public interest and swiftly and effectively get all that work done. Absolutely. Uh, we, we need a leader at the CPSC, a chair. Right now there are only two commissioners, one acting as the chair. We will escalate up to five commissioners as of next August. The chair of the CPSC is really where the power lies. The is power there? lies with the chair to coordinate and hire and control the agenda of the commission. Has to get the votes of at least a majority of the other commissioners, but really controls the agenda. We're looking for someone with pro-consumer credentials rather than someone from the manufacturing industry or K Street where all the industry's lawyers work. And so President Obama, that's all he has to do, and then he has to support increased budgets every year, and we think things will be good. In the last uh, minute that we have on this, there were also some products that uh, were exempted from coverage, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. I'm wondering if you think uh, there is an opportunity to expand the scope of coverage to include uh, for instance, automobiles and other products that were left out? Well, uh, very briefly, I think that the, uh, the CPSC has coverage of 15,000 different consumer products. We think of the children's products, but it also has snow blowers, escalators, chainsaws, your toaster, and everything else. NHTSA, the Highway Traffic Safety Administration, has cars. Uh, there, there are um, interesting ways that we could approach broadening the scope of the CPSC. Um, it'd be worthwhile for Congress to take a look. Yeah, I think if uh, if uh, I, I think that Congress has sort of done its work on this on this agency for a while, and there's every reason to expect that uh, things are going to be dramatically improved. Um, I don't think anyone's anxious to to look back at at, at it too quickly. They want to see how how it's working under the new law. Um, but if I were going to look at it and think about ways to improve. Um, Instead of expanding the agency's jurisdiction, actually, I would I would look back to a little bit about its internal administration, f uh, sort of uh, streamline its rulemaking process, um, make sure that it can it can make safety standards quickly, more quickly than it can right now. Uh, it's very slow to address problems, and some of that's just built into the the type of rulemaking it has to it has to go through. Um, there are a few a few things like that that I would actually look at first.
All right. Well, many thanks to David Arkish of Congress Watch and Ed Merzwinski of U.S. PERG for joining us to talk about the far-reaching new consumer and employee protection provisions in the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. When we return, blowing the whistle at the EPA. Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. Imagine you are a scientist working for EPA and discover strong evidence that a chemical we put in our drinking water causes cancer. So you speak out about it and you're fired. That's what happened to Dr. William Marcus in 1992. Happily, Robert Reich ordered EPA to reinstate Dr. Marcus. But the fluoride still in drinking water and Dr. Marcus's EPA colleague and union representative, Dr. William Hersey, now a chemistry professor at American University in Washington, D.C., is still blowing the whistle on what he calls a protected pollutant. And there's more. Welcome, Dr. Hersey, to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, Mark. Um, tell me about your background, educational background, professional background before you came to EPA. Yes, I, um, uh, got a PhD at the University of Missouri uh, as an organic chemist. I worked for 19 years at Monsanto as a research chemist and environmental manager. And in 1981, um, joined the Environmental Protection Agency as senior scientist in the risk assessment division and uh, immediately began to join other professionals at EPA trying to organize a labor union to uh, protect EPA professionals against the very kind of thing that happened to Dr. Marcus. And, and tell me what prompted the organization precisely. Um, Ronald Reagan and Ann Gorsuch in a word, or two words, or four, <laughs> as the case may be. Um, um, Reagan came in with a reputation of being anti-labor, anti-environment, and uh, certainly um, uh, lived up to that. And the uh, professional community EPA when I joined it was uh, already uh, having informal meetings trying to decide what to do about that. We considered forming a professional association, forming a labor union, doing other kinds of things and we quickly came to the conclusion that the legal rights that are granted to a labor union made a whole lot of sense for us uh, to, to go down that path, and that's that's what we ultimately did. Despite the fact that you were professional employees. Oh yes, yes, it's uh, not all that unusual actually for professional employees to be to be organized. Of course, teachers are, are organized, and, and there are others. And there are other, um, as it turns out, there were other bargaining units at, at the Environmental Protection Agency involving professionals who were organized at that time too. But at headquarters, the professionals were not organized, not represented. Tell me how fluoride got on your radar screen. Radar screen. Um, we had uh, the first problem that we had with the agency over professional ethics, as, as, as it turned out to be our, our defining principle, happened to be over um, EPA's abandoning some uh, rules on asbestos. And that got out into the media that the, there was this band of um, professionals at EPA headquarters who were concerned about professional ethics. At that same time, there, were, um, uh, there was a settlement of a lawsuit between the Nat uh, Natural Resources Defense Council and EPA over uh, drinking water standards. And uh, fluoride was a, was a major um, uh, problem for some folks. Uh, when they heard about us, they called us and said, uh, hey, would you folks like to hear a seminar on fluoride toxicity? And being a bunch of scientific nerds, we said, well, of course. And so Dr. John Yumianis came to headquarters and gave us the seminar, and I must say the scales fell from our eyes. I, like everyone else uh, practically in the U.S. at the time, thought fluoride was one of the best things since sliced bread. But uh, we soon learned that there was a lot more to the story than what the propaganda machine of the, uh, of the government and the American Dental Association was telling us about fluoride. And what did you learn, and how did this, and, and where did Dr. Marcus come into the picture? 
Well, we, we learned of the um, of a number of aspects of what was going on with the, with the uh, with the drinking water standard, but. Uh, uh, bad effects on the bone. Um, uh, it turns out that there were a bunch of mutagenicity uh, studies uh, on fluoride that weren't included in the technical support document that EPA was forwarding at the time to support their, and their drinking. And mutagenicity means what? Uh, means uh, the chemical can affect the, the uh, um, DNA of, of cells and, and cause strange things to happen, which can include cancer. Um, so, in fact, we were then asked to join a, a lawsuit, specifically uh, an, an, another lawsuit that NRDC brought against EPA over the drinking water standard, and that was 1985, and we've been studying the problem and fighting this issue ever since. And what happened to Dr. Marcus exactly? Well, in 1977, before all of this uh, that I just talked about happened, um, there was a congressional hearing. It was the only congressional hearing, by the way, on whether or not to put fluoride in drinking water. One of the outcomes of that hearing was that Congress ordered a cancer study to be conducted on, on fluoride. And by 1990, the preliminary results of that study were, were, were released. And the finding was uh, clear evidence of carcinogenicity in male rats which would have been the end of the water fluoridation program that had been pushed by the federal government, by the U.S. Public Health Service uh, since uh, 1950, basically. Well, that could not be allowed to, to stand, uh, according to the, um, the structure of the way things are. So uh, a special committee was brought in. Uh, the uh, slides were reviewed, um, and the, uh, the result of that was that the finding was downgraded to equivocal evidence of carcinogenicity in male rats. Well, Dr. Marcus, who is a trained toxicologist, in fact was the senior toxicologist in the Office of Drinking Water at the time, uh, could not live with that. And he basically couldn't keep his big mouth shut about it. And he went around and, and talked a lot about them. Had a, as a matter of fact, had a press conference at the National Press Club, among other things, and, and talked about this. And EPA decided to trump up some charges and fired him. And um, then that began uh, basically a two-year struggle in the wilderness for him and uh, his supporters, which included the union, um, to uh, obtain justice. And ultimately, as you indicated at the beginning here, in 1992, um, Secretary Reich uh, finally implemented the uh, administrative law judge's order to reinstate him with back pay and $50,000 compensatory damage and, and... I want to talk about another uh, incident that you faced uh, while at EPA, uh, and it has to do with a pesticide called malathion. Uh, tell me about that. Uh, yes. Um, one of the cases that I was deeply involved in was being a, a union steward to Dr. Brian Dementi, who was EPA's expert on malathion. Um, uh, th that um, th there are so many facets to that case, it's 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 hard to summarize briefly. But in essence, um, um, it, one one sh short way of looking at this was a a scientific committee of EPA toxicologists was was meeting on uh, had one of their first meetings on the re-registration of, of of malathion, and the senior science advisor for the assistant administrator came in and said, you know, malathion is a big ticket chemical and we don't want any problems. What's it used for? <laughs> it's, it's used on a um, very large fraction of the wheat crop in the U.S. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's in some household um, um, uh, pesticides. The way the pesticide law is written is that the EPA registers pesticides for certain kinds of uses. There are other uses, however, which are outside the registration, and that was part of the problem. Malathion has also been used to spray for mosquitoes to uh, uh, inhibit West Nile virus problems, uh, medfly problems in Florida and in California, and boll weevil eradication involving mass spraying of this stuff over uh, populated areas. And that was one of the things that had Dr. Dementi upset. Um, and what happened to him? Um, he, he was basically isolated um, by management, um, removed from certain committees, um, refused um, his uh, request to go to, to technical meetings and that sort of thing. He was basically put on the shelf 
Uh, in, fact, in fact, they tried to remove him from the toxic from the uh, uh, project on Malathion several times, but we f we fought back and and got him reinstated each time. Um, ultimately, he, for um, medical reasons and, and other reasons, he decided to retire several years ago. But he maintains an interest, and I keep telling him, Brian, you got to publish on this because there is a there is a way yet to 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 get your information out. Well, let me ask you this: It makes sense to me, just from a a, a, a self interest standpoint, why a company that manufactures malathion or that uses malathion in its products would uh, um, spin the uh, information data about its uh, safety and uh, so that it would be on the market. Uh, that makes, it's not ethical, but it, I understand why that would happen. What I don't get is why would an agency like EPA that exists in order to protect the public from just that, such a thing, uh, uh, roll over on a case like that. Well, that's uh, that's a that's a very good that's an extremely good qu question and one of the reasons why the union exists. We uh, we in the civil service take an oath very much the same as the military does to support and defend the constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic. There are some folks uh in the civil service nevertheless who elect not to live up to that oath and are willing to twist the law when the law says you will set uh, an adequate um, margin of safety for a pesticide unless certain criteria are met, uh, they will elect to ignore that law. And that, in our eyes, makes them domestic enemies and we will go against it. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons people will do that is that uh, the old revolving door is, is an issue. Um, well, going from government to industry, exactly. And so you're exactly. That, I don't. I don't mean. I don't mean to say that that everybody who formerly worked at EPA and is now working in the pesticide industry, um, you know, it was unethical or did things like that. But it is a well known. It is a well known fact that um, if you work in the pesticide office. Uh, you're in a position to do some good things for the pesticide industry, and um, one hand washes the other, as my Sicilian friends sometimes say. <laughs> <laughs> well, many thanks to Dr. William Hersey for joining us to talk about the cases of fluoride and malathion and what they tell us about the treatment of science and scientists at the EPA during the Bush years. The Obama administration promises a new era at the EPA in which science will drive agency policy and whistleblowers will be treated as courageous public servants, as it should be. I'm Mark Cohen. This has been Whistle Where You Work.